Hello, and welcome to the Semiconductor Industry Association's public webinar series, where we discuss topics that are important to the chip industry. My name is Robert Casanova. I am the Director of Industry Statistics and Economic Policy here at SIA, and I will be your host and moderator for today's webinar, where we discuss uh, powering the future, how semiconductor innovation uh, drives greater energy efficiency and productivity. Um, before I begin the webinar, just a quick housekeeping for uh, Q&A. Please use the Q&A function within um, the Zoom chat or the Zoom link um, and not the chat function. Um, it's my pleasure to actually uh, introduce a, a fantastic group of, of uh, experts on power semiconductors um, and how they are, are really at the forefront of uh, innovating in uh, energy consumption for those technologies that are driving um, innovation in, in generative AI, automotive industry, as well as industrial manufacturing. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Al Wu. He's the Managing Director of Multimarket. Recording in progress. Recording in progress. Recording in progress. <laughs> Uh, he's the uh, Multi-Market Power Business Unit uh, Managing Director at NLM Devices. Um, Ala El Sharif is the Senior Fellow and Chief Architect at uh, NXP. Jeff Halbig is the Product Marketing Manager for ST Microelectronics. And Atar uh, Zaidi is the Senior Vice President and Business Line Head of Power IC and Connectivity at Infineon. Uh, so with that, I'd like to pass it along to Al Wu to begin the uh, his presentation. Take it away, Al. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my slides. Um, if not, please let me know. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, power management ICs and, and really how important they are uh, to the overall economy and to the world. And so without further ado, I'll just jump into some Example um, use cases. I think uh, most people are very aware of how important uh, the automotive industry is uh, to economies of the world. Uh, certainly, even today, with all the uh, EV efforts that are happening, and you know, when we think about automotive uh, power, uh, we are all probably quite familiar with various subsystems uh, within vehicles. So obviously there are many cameras these days and infotainment systems and you know power distribution right for EVs and, and other uses. Uh, these are just some examples I'm mentioning. And while you know these systems require uh, state-of-the-art processors and, and many other things to make them function, uh, power management is certainly kind of the infrastructure that's needed in the car to enable these functions to even happen. So for instance, within uh, cameras, within systems, uh, we need compact and efficient power. You know, cameras are small, they're all over the vehicles these days. So we need compact and efficient power for that. Uh, many times we have uh, PMIX, power management integrated circuits that are more dedicated for camera power as well. If we move over to infotainment, right? Infotainment is the word we use to describe the displays, the dashes, you know, everything that is kind of more like, you know, iPhone-like, if you will, within the car. Uh, these require highly integrated power. They also uh, require power for powering the displays that are in modern vehicles. And, and of course, audio, right? Audio is a big part of the driving experience these days. Uh, power distribution, uh, this, all this power has to come from somewhere. I think most people are familiar with in the old, you know, alternators and internal combustion engines, but of course with EVs, the power source is a giant battery pack. You have to take this power and send it throughout the vehicle to the places where it's needed. And that requires, you know, low noise uh, protection and other things that are related to getting that power around. There's a lot of uh, news these days about uh, 48 volt uh, conversion. So this is the effort uh, being done by many car companies to convert what is traditionally a 12 volt system, I think that many of us are familiar with, into a 48 volt system. And the reason to do that is to uh, save a lot of weight and gain power efficiency, because at 48 volts, you need much less copper cabling within the car uh, to get the power around. I think many of you know the famous, you know, kind of the Cybertruck uh, had an announcement where they've moved uh, fully to the 48 volt 
system for all of their uh, kind of uh, subsystems within the, within the vehicle. Uh, and then lastly, one more example would be LED lighting, right? Cars moved to LED headlight lamps uh, many years ago, but these are becoming more and more advanced as time goes on. Uh, the modern vehicles have what we call matrix uh, dimming, where they can actually develop a pattern uh, instead of high beam, low beam, which is very uh, simplistic. They can do something much more precise where it can actually dim out the light that would go into the eyes of an oncoming driver. So it becomes very selective kind of in the dimming. So these are all examples of where, uh, you know, the press might talk a lot about all these other subsystems, but power, power management is a fundamental part that is needed and, and very important for this area. Uh, industrial automation, right? Um, in, industrial uh, market is it's huge for all of our, all of the world economies. Uh, there's many examples. Here's one of a robotic arm. So in a robot, obviously, uh, motion, motor control is really important. Uh, typical arms like this have many, many motors inside of them. Uh, they require power. So in this case, uh, we use, uh, again, is a gallium nitride uh, type drivers to drive uh, switches to really control the motors more precisely than what could have been done in the past. So that's one example in the, in the arm. There's a lot of precision sensing that is needy, needed. And because of that, you, you need power management products that have low noise uh, built into the architecture so that the noise does not corrupt the signal that is being sensed. Okay. Uh, power distribution, uh, again, similar to an automo uh, into, the, into a car, uh, we have to distribute power throughout the machine. Fault tolerance is important. Isolated power is important. Um, in general, in these kind of applications, uh, miniaturization is important. Uh, you know, the volume of space is at a premium in these kind of uh, use cases. So high efficiency and miniaturization is important for the power uh, circuits. And then lastly, uh, monitoring is important. So a lot of these systems, you know, there's a lot of safety that has to be built in. So really you need to monitor kind of what's happening with the power supplies, make sure, you know, some fault isn't happening or if it does happen, you need to be able to take uh, kind of active action to make sure that that fault doesn't uh, cause a problem. So these are all different aspects of how power is really an integral part of kind of this industrial automation uh, space. Data center. Um, data center is a huge uh, topic, I think, uh, especially with AI, which, which other speakers will be covering in detail. But in a data center, you know, there's racks of equipment doing computation, uh, moving data back and forth. And in that uh, system, uh, system management is important uh, in terms of power. So we see um, in data center. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, within the data center, uh, system management in terms of uh, precision measurement and control of the power supplies is, is paramount. Uh, this can help uh, predict faults that could happen in the future. So you can actually look at what's happening kind of in the overall system as time goes on and, and uh, take preventative uh, action in that case. Uh, hot swap is another big area in terms of power. So you can imagine in data centers when there's an issue with a card, you, you cannot turn off the entire machine to replace the card. That would uh, wipe out you know, that whole column of co uh, computation while you do that. So that's why there's... Uh, Things called hot swap. This allows you to safely remove cars, cards out of the rack while the rack is still active and powered and then replace it with another card. Uh, so there's products that are very important for that function. Uh, distribution buses are important in data centers. So uh, power comes in off the grid or, or, you know, with solar maybe generating some of that as well. Um, and then you have to take this power and, and distribute it throughout the rack and the data center to achieve the functions that are, that are needed for that uh, for that uh, uh, use okay um other things right optical uh, modulation or optical uh, devices are very important in data centers i think most people know that fiber optics are used extensively to move the kind of modern amounts of data that we need uh, going throughout the world and so power is really important for those optical modules they have to be small they have to be precise there's also needs of controlling temperature on uh, optical elements to uh, kind of tune in the bandwidth of those lasers or receivers, right? 
And then lastly, uh, power over Ethernet. Uh, this is a, a really interesting area where uh, you know you send, of course, data over Ethernet uh, cables. Of course, I think we're all very familiar with that. But power Ethernet allows the ability to also send power over the same sort of uh, Ethernet cables that you use for data. And so this has obvious advantages when it comes to installation in new buildings or data centers, et cetera, where you don't have to do power separately. So these are all quite important to, to the market. Really, my, my presentation is kind of, you know, showing uh, I chose three what we call vertical markets, the automotive, industrial automation, and the data center. There's actually many more, right? There's no time today to go over all of them. But I think you can maybe hopefully understand the breadth of you know the needs of power, how fractured and how varied they are uh, in terms of power management that's needed by all of these different markets. Kind of a, a, you could say an analog to that is that at least at uh, analog devices, because it's such a fractured power market with so many disparate different types of uses needed, we also have kind of as a result, a very, you could say flexible, but also a very, a very supply chain. And, you know, supply chain is in the news a lot these days for, for many reasons. Uh, this slide is showing, kind of telling that story of how varied it really is. So, you know, in the uh, blue dots are, for example, ADI internal sites. These could be wafer fabs. They could also be, and they are also test and packaging facilities that we have that are within the company. But as in, in the case of many uh, companies as well in this area, we also use a lot of external um, vendors like foundries or external assembly and test. So external foundries are in red and then external assembly. And again, that's assembling. So, you know, we, we make wafers, of course, to make the products. And again, we have internal wafer fabs that do that and they're in blue. Okay, and, and there's uh, four in the US and, and they're all over the place. Then we use external foundries also to make our products and they are in the red uh, circles. And those are, some are in the US, some are, uh, obviously many are not in the US, okay. And then lastly, you make the wafer, of course, you're not done. You have to assemble the wafer, dice it up, assemble the little die, you have then test it, right? You have to do packaging and test. And so our ex external assembly and tests are in the green dots. So really, because we have such a power management, such a varied field with so many different needs, uh, many times our supply chains kind of mirror that complexity. And that's kind of shown in this slide here, where we have facilities uh, all over the world. Some are internally owned, some are external. So uh, hopefully that paints a, you know, a, a, a picture of how important pen power management ICs are. Uh, to the overall economy and how uh, widely used they really are. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Al. Uh, great presentation. I, I remember, you know, in the old days, I went to an automotive factory and, and had the opportunity to see one of those big robotic, industrial robotic arms, and it's it's pretty fascinating. Um, now I'll pass it along to Al, Al Sharif to uh, uh, give his presentation. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss with you the trends. Uh, I will build up on the story I just presented here. What are driving, what are the factors driving the uh, power semiconductor technology and architecture with all trends happening in the industry today? I have this slide just show here that the AI and machine learning are a big driver. Of course, Al mentioned the automotive industry, the challenge in the automotive, and those have been factored for many years. We have been working on that for years, but these days we are seeing new trends. The new trends are fueled by the AI and machine learning, and those wouldn't be true without the high-performance compute SOCs, which is GPUs and CPUs, as well as high-speed networking. Of course, AI and machine learning, you can see that it has a lot of implication, good implication to our life. It, it become our life more productive, maybe could be safer. Uh, you can see them in software-defined vehicle. You see them in mobile and personal and uh, devices and, and 
health, even in robotic surgery and imaging, and factory automation, logistics, many, many areas. We, we expect that the AI and machine learning will grow dramatically over the next uh, uh, years. If, but the problem now that those AI trends are generating huge demand of energy. You can see here's a few examples here, 50 billion connected devices, 700 watt GPUs by NVIDIA, uh, the amount of electricity consumed, 5% of the global electricity consumed the world was in 22, and 27 expected 1.5 million new servers, AI server to be added. In the same time, you know that there are a lot of efforts in sustainability and e-waste reduction, and that examples like the 48 volt adoption and the servers and the automotive, as well as the USB type C. So this is kind of like contradictory now. So now we are facing a problem. We are facing energy demand. At the same time, we are trying to do sustainability. So what, 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 how can we help here? I think this is the role of the power management. That's the reason the power management now is becoming so critical to bring new architectures that enable high efficiency and enable the sustainability and the e-waste reduction while maintaining the power demand for the AI and the machine learning. At the same time, functional safety and predictable maintenance, predictable failure are becoming even more important now. So this slide here is show you the mega trends that it drives our innovation and in architecture in the power management ICs architecture at NXP. Of course, you can see the first two columns here are dominated by the SOC. The SOC, we're talking about GPU or CPU. And you can see, you, as you know, of course, all of you, the amount of compute power keeps going up. And as a result, the amount of power consumption going up. So now we need to deliver more power level on those DC-DC converters powering those SOCs. So now we are talking about higher current, uh, higher uh, uh, power density components. We are talking about technology. Jeff later will be talking about technology. High power density technology becoming a necessity now, very important. Distributed architecture, multi-phases, up to 16 phase maybe could be to deliver those kind of components. Uh, in the same time, low power mode, very important because now everything is, doesn't turn off fully. It's stay in standby mode. So you need also light load efficiency. So light load efficiency and full load efficiency are very important. On the same time, the scaling of the SOC, now three nanometer, maybe two nanometer or 1.8 nanometer Intel is working on now is coming very soon. And then those will show a lot of challenges for us now from tolerance, from the accuracy of the DC DC converter, how fast it is to manage the fast transient response and how to manage aging and the process and the variation and the temperature variation on the device. On the same time, the exciting news also, of course, the vehicle evolution as L touch the 48 volt, but it's not only the 48 volt, it's the software defined vehicle, the zonalization of the vehicle. It's bringing new challenges, how you monitor the power, you do need smarter power management devices and power energy management, how you manage the high voltage, the 400 volt, 800 volt in electrification now, the, how we manage that with isolation and technology, uh, the, the predictable failure, the fault tolerant, all those are new challenges. And the, in the same time, there are other areas also benefiting from AI and, lear and, and machine learning. They are not as high power as the one we mentioned here, and they are in the USB type C, they are in the smart wearable market. All of those require also a lot of innovation. So this is show you how you need to do new architecture, new innovation to address different markets and mainly fueled by the AI and uh, machine learning. Here, because the limited time here, I'll just touch on two examples here. And you can see the analogy between the data centers and the vehicles. So the first diagram here show you the data center and the, the, the bottom one, the second one show you the BEV, the battery electric vehicle. And of course, because the amount of power going up for those servers, AI powered servers, either on the cloud server or on the vehicle, you need to adopt something higher voltage bus like 48 volt. And 48 volt is being adopted in many applications to manage the distribution losses. But at the same time, once you go to 48 volt now, the SOC require high speed DC-DC converters. So now you need to, to design new type of DC-DC convert for point of load to operate at lower voltage. So that highlight the importance of front converters. Front converters now, how I go from 400 volt down to 48 volt, and then now I go from the 48 volt down to 
the 5 volt to 12 volt to drive the PIMIC, the point of load. Those are the multi-phase PIMICs, the VRMs driving the SOC. So three main architectures are very key now. The resonant converter, that those type of resonant converter and flat efficiency, those are key to deliver high efficiency from the AC supply down to the 48 volt bus. And then from the 48 volt bus, now you need a high efficiency converter. Switch cap converters are really attractive because they are bringing very high efficiency. They enabled us at NXP to bring fast charging in the mobile phones. And now this, that mobile phones, as you know, they were 20 volt, but now with the 48 volt wide conversion ratio, that those switch cap converters are so beneficial to address the front stage conversion here from 48 volt to five or 12 volt. And then the point of load, the point of load now, you, you need to have faster point of load running at higher bandwidths and also adaptive voltage uh, positioning or group control to manage the transit response. Investing on in those three architectures can help to bring high efficiency in the system and manage all the energy demand and the losses in the system. Again, the sum in summary here, I said the AI is introducing new demand for energy. So we need to come up with the different architectures, very efficient architectures to manage all the energy demand. Uh, I didn't touch on other application. There are other more, more applications, not less important and the USB type C EPR. Now use USB type C, as you know, moving to 48 volt and uh, for 240 watt to reduce the e-waste and also industrial and IoT and wearable, all of this is a other area of innovation at NXP. Uh, NXP also, to, I don't have a slide like uh, like Al to show the, the about the company, but NXP is a global company, very fragmented, and we, for analog side and power side, we develop our own technology. We have fabs in the US, as well as we use Foundry as well to address all our demands. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Um, you know, it'd be really interesting to see as we move down to you know three or two or one point eight nanometers how power semiconductors are going to really uh, be essential. Um, now, I'll pass it over to Atar Zaidi to uh, provide his pre presentation. Okay. All right. All right, I will, uh, I'll try to take it at a different height level. I will not go into the details of um, technology, but I just want to frame how big powering AI uh, problem is uh, for you, for the mankind and what are the opportunities behind that. Uh, since last March, the world has changed um, with the advancement of uh, large language model um, back in March when GPT-3 was launched. So every three, 0.4 months, the amount of computing which is required to train these models are doubling. Um, it took G G G G GPT only five days to reach 100 million users, and it's a huge market. It's already approaching 200 billion. 77% um, of the global population is using AI in some shape and form, whether it is a smart device that we um, all have in our pockets or a smart watch or through um, use of the apps uh, which run on the cloud. So AI is transformational, it is here to stay. It is the biggest revolution um, in our lifetime so far. What does it mean? Um, based on the, pro the pro yeah, projected demand of electricity going forward, uh, if the consumption of power con yeah, continues to grow as it is growing right now, roughly 10% year over year, by the end of the decade, 7% of the global electricity will be used in the data center. Um, the situation has become so dire that the um, country of Ireland is saying no more data centers because we don't have anything left for our people. Northern Virginia um, has reached a limit of the grid right now. And 7% by 2030 corresponds to roughly the consumption of electricity by India, which is the fourth largest economy in the world. So that is the scale that we are talking about, um, and it has changed. Uh, so if you look at the curve, the curve is trending very, very fast. So that's why the power management of the data center driving AI is, is very important. Um, just to give you an example, if you, look, if you do a standard uh, web query, um, it, it normally consumes less than one watt hour. 
if you use an intelligent one using GPT-3 Gen AI, uh, it takes almost 10x. And then if you have to train the model, it's consuming almost 1,000 megawatt hour of energy. Um, the growth of grid power is roughly 2% year over year. The demand of AI power is roughly 10% year over year. So that's where the big disconnect is. Uh, so there is a focus which is required on powering AI without compromising robustness and total cost of ownership. Just to give you an idea, uh, Google and Microsoft, they consume roughly 35 billion year liters of water in just cooling, uh, which is equivalent to city of San Jose with population of roughly 800,000 people. And these are the only two com companies in the world which, and this LLM uh, journey has just started. So, we believe at Infineon that efficient AI is a multi-dimensional problem. Um, this problem has been solved um, in one dim dimension right now, which is increasing the computation power of the processor. Um, not too long ago, the average um, theoretical load in a, in, a, in, a, in a processor would consume roughly 400 watts. These are the accelerators. In just two years, that number went to 700 watts. Um, and then the projection is by 2026, that number will be more than 2,000 watts. The peak current used to be roughly 240 amps. Now they are already approaching 1,500 amps. Um, the size of the solution is not increasing, which means things are running hot, density is becoming a problem. And we believe that brute force computation um, is not the way to go. We have to prioritize energy efficiency at every stage of the power con conversion, starting from the grid to the core. This is an example on the right side. You can see that how the computation power has, in uh, has increased uh, uh, in NVIDIA, different accelerators starting from Pascal, now going into Blackwell. So from roughly 20 teraflops going to 20,000 teraflops um, in the matter of roughly six to eight years. That's 1,000x AI compute in eight years. Um, and that is also reflected in the consumption of power, going from 400 watts to roughly 2.4 kilowatts. So roughly 6x increase in power. Um, unfortunately, right now, the way the AI problem is tackled is, is just to, through brute force, uh, and power is after the fact. Um, companies are focusing on how to go from 7 nano to 4 nano to 3 nano to 1 nanometer in, eventually in the future. The core voltages are coming down, the peak currents are going up, and that leads into power losses as the current flow into a very small area. So there is a need to re-architect the whole system. So the challenges that we are focusing at Infineon uh, there is a there is a there is a real risk of drain on the grid, uh, which is which is a big problem. Carbon footprint of these AI server, which are extremely energy intensive, uh, is pretty high. Water consumption, as I talk about, is through the roof. Half of that water is is actually wasted. It it is cheaper to use fresh water rather than recycle the water, um, and 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 use it in cooling. And all that leads to uh, e-waste, um, which is which is not good for the planet. So at Infineon, we have um, our guiding principle is decarbonization and, and digitalization, and that's where we are focused. So how are we going about it? Uh, we are innovating on various fronts. Um, the previous two speakers have talked about 48 volt systems. We are taking uh, way ahead and we say, okay, 48 volt systems are here to stay. Pretty much everything which is powering AI is 48 volt. It's more efficient to transfer power at a higher voltage because it uh, uh, re reduces the current um, uh, by squared. Uh, but we are also thinking about vertical power e delivery. How can we power um, uh, where the power is re required? Right now, the power is all around the processor. And every millimeter on that board is a wasted power, which is used to heat the air around the processor. So the idea is how do we make the power 
more energy efficient and bring it underneath the processor so that um, we minimize what we call the power del delivery net year network losses. We're also looking from the grid to the core. So um, silicon on the AC-DC side is running out of steam. That's why we are working on a wide band gap material like silicon carbide and gallium nitrides to do e efficient power supplies. And um, um, advanced packaging is, is it front and right um, of solving this problem. Uh, these packages need to be smart enough. They need to be efficient enough uh, to do smart cooling. And then the whole system needs to be controlled in a smarter way. That's why we invest in uh, software systems. We, so we invest in digital power. We invest in telemetry. Um, think about it. And uh, NVIDIA is selling these one card anywhere between $30,000 to $40,000 per. And if a small element of power goes wrong onto, on, the, on those boards, uh, NVIDIA's customers are going to be very un unhappy. So that's why robustness and, and reliability is super important. Just by re-architecting the system, bringing the power very, very close to where the power is required, we believe that we can gain roughly 8 to 10% improvement in efficiency. That translates to total cost of ownership to the data center like Microsoft and Google and Meta, uh, because these are the companies who have to run those day data center and pay the energy bill. Uh, we believe um, and we have proven that there is a path to increase the power density by roughly 30 to 60 percent. Robustness, super important. It cannot be com compromised in any way. And everything translates to the total cost of ownership. If you do all of that, it 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 leads to massive saving. Um, uh, in 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 reducing the carbon foot your, your footprint um, of these ta your, your, your data center, uh, which are very very energy intensive. So this is uh, this is one example. So if you look at the DC uh, the traditional way, you have um, AC coming in, but get get gets con converted into forty eight volt. Then from forty eight volt, it goes to twelve volt. And then it goes to a processor, and the power is all around the processor. And and the these the squiggly line here shows on the left hand side with lateral mounting that power is wasted on on the board, and that power could be anywhere ten to twelve percent. If you bring the power instead of around the processor underneath the processor, we believe that there's a massive saving. Just to give you an idea, um, just by having a module where you put the magnetic component over the power com component, we can save roughly 2% uh, board power that will allow processors to be 30% more powerful. So right now, theoretical uh, performance of these processors is actually much higher. The bottleneck is in the power um, because when these processors, they operate at at full speed, uh, things get very hard, so they have to throttle it back. So an incremental improvement in efficiency on the board leads to many full efficiency on the rack level as well as on the data center year level. And, and that is the focus that we have today. Uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Um, We'll pass it along to, to Jeff Halbig to give his presentation. Jeff. Thank you very much, Robert. And uh, thanks everybody for this opportunity to discuss power semiconductors. Uh, and thank you very much to all the panelists here, my esteemed colleagues in this industry for helping convey some of these messages, uh, which I'll be reinforcing. So similar to what we've heard before, I'm, I'm going to go and take this from the use case from the PMIX or the power management ICs or the intelligent components that are, are creating the uh, the methods of control of energy in our electrical systems and kind of talk about uh, the dumb workhorses or the switches that go into these that these power management ICs are controlling and why they really are the heart of these energy conversion systems and very critical in innovation for multiple different reasons, because these switches are the are the sources of the losses. Uh, and of course we wanna mitigate that so that we have you know, more energy created with less resources so that we have more performance using less energy uh, so that we can drive farther with our electric vehicles without range anxiety and get more people to adopt these and accelerate the decarbonization of our transportation methods 
and have more reliable connectivity solutions. So really these power semiconductors through their shaping of the energy from the either the utility grid or a battery, battery management system or a battery system or from a renewable solar panel are critical to innovate in order to enable these four pillars of, uh, of energy conversion systems uh, improvements that we want to see in our society. And to again, reinforce messages we've heard at a very high level of why this is so important. Um, we saw many different metrics of how data center AI processing is impacting and growing and uh, uh, growing and impacting the world. Uh, but generally at, at the highest level, crypto mining from uh, data center and just general IoT usage, as well as AI and other all these emerging trends, we're going to see a 30% increase in electrical demand and power just in this decade alone, which is just an incredibly staggering increase in power consumption that we've never seen the likes of. So this is one of the main reasons we need to improve the way this power is generated and delivered. Um, of course, we need to also have, keep in mind uh, sustainability metrics. We need to reduce our, our carbon footprints. Um, and as part of that, uh, continuing the trend in re using renewable energy as a source of our electrical energy is, is critical. And those renewable systems require an intense amount of power semiconductor to be put in them in order to uh, transfer that power uh, from uh, non-renewable sources into a renewable source of energy. At ST, much like uh, the other semiconductor companies you've met here, we tackled this problem from a uh, customer enablement through solution uh, approach. So each of our companies has a wide array of products that uh, can allow us to develop expertise and enable the customer's development of the system. We don't sell just one product that the customer is responsible for using and innovating around. We as semiconductor companies bring multiple different types of power semiconductors to life within these customers and enable much faster time to market solutions so that we can gain the benefits of the latest technology innovations in a rapid way. So you see the variety of different semiconductor technologies in which ST is a major factor in from digital uh, intelligent ICs through to smart power ICs, similar to the PMIX that we've seen presented earlier. Uh, and again, I mentioned that I'll be focused on what we consider sort of the workhorse simple switches or the power MOSFETs that go into uh, power supply. So we talk about the power transistor market. And again, I want, for those of you that are non-technical, I, I want to describe what the, the power transistor is. As I mentioned, it's a simple switch. And these switches, as they turn on and off, are used to shape the energy that we get from an energy source. Again, whether it be the grid, a battery, a renewable source, into something that's usable by our end product uh, that we have impacting our lives, whether that's a refrigerator, a cell phone, a television, an electric vehicle, all of these require different shapes of energy from what we can get from the various energy systems that are providing that energy. So the power transistor is responsible in combination with the PMIC of shaping that energy in the right way and doing it efficiently. And for this reason, we see a tremendous boom in the power transistor market. You can see from these growth stats that just in the uh, five years starting from 2022, it's projected that this market overall will grow by almost 60 percent. Of course, the uh, the trends that are driving this are power conversion within industrial, I mentioned uh, solar already, but also charging stations for EVs. And actually not just electric vehicles themselves, but even traditional automotive has much, much more content as it's becoming much more like a cell phone than a traditional transportation method that has a lot of power that's uh, that needs to be moved around within the system, whether that be a 48 volt system or a 12 volt system. And one of the key technologies that's showing the most growth as you look at this bar chart is through a wide band gap material, which is silicon carbide. Uh, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the innovations in silicon carbide and why it's growing so dramatically. So bear with me. I'm going to do uh, use a little bit of electrical physics terms here, but don't get too scared. I promise I'll explain it to you and how it, how it impacts uh, in layman's terms by the end of this progression of this chart. But uh, silicon carbide is a wide band gap material. So uh, compared to standard silicon, silicon carbide, the combination of carbon plus silicon as a compound has three times the band gap as a material property. What does that mean? It means it has 10 times higher of a critical electric field than standard silicon. Okay, 
I'm not helping you out anymore. I'm like, let's get down to it. What does that mean? It means that the power semiconductor has a trade-off here in improvement. So you can either have it operating at a higher voltage or the similar size of the component uh, up to 10 times, or for a similar operating voltage compared to silicon, you can have it be 10 times smaller. Now, what does that mean at the end of the application? It means that you have a similar size die, you can decrease the resistance of that switch. The resistance is the enemy. It's what's consuming that power as we're shaping that energy and causing it to be less efficient. So we can lower that resistance and make a more efficient power semiconductor up to 90% more efficient with silicon carbide than standard silicon. Or we can also take that smaller product and the smaller product uh, innately is able to switch faster. So we can do up to 10 times faster switching on and off, which has the benefits of um, more efficient performance in terms of switching, but also having a system impact of being able to shrink the size of the solution um, due to uh, the other components that go around the power semiconductor that can shrink because of the faster switching speeds. Uh, why doesn't everybody do this? And why isn't the silicon carbide market dominating transistors right now? Well, one of the major reasons is that it's really hard to do. Uh, the manufacturing flow of silicon carbide and the expertise is only held by a handful of semiconductor companies out there, although there are more that are trying to gain that intelligence every day. ST has been in this market and since 2012. I'm proud to say that we have 50% market share within silicon carbide today, mainly due to our uh, very collaborative approach that we've done with some of the major EV makers uh, in the United States. And uh, NST is one of the few companies that is can claim to be completely vertically integrated in terms of its manufacturing flow. So from taking the raw silicon and carbon powder together through a furnace, creating an ingot, going into our ST-owned fabs, front-end fabs, where we do the lithography to create the device, to testing. Silicon carbide has a very different test that needs to be done versus standard silicon to ensure its reliability through the back-end assembly where innovation and packaging uh, is enabling our customers to more easily remove the heat that's generated from the power semiconductor uh, and create a mechanically more simple device. Uh, this total manufacturing flow uh, requires a tremendous amount of expertise and investment. Uh, and then in turn, we bring that expertise and these capabilities of these semiconductors to the end makers of the power uh, system and enable a much more efficient power system for the end application. To get more specific about these applications, I'll focus on, on some of the specifics of automotive and some of them industrial. So now that you have a, a more efficient power semiconductor, what does that really mean? Well, in automotive, it means that you can enable a longer driving range. You're not consuming as much power from that uh, electric vehicle battery. Uh, again, reducing the range anxiety, getting more people to adopt electric vehicles if they're more confident that they'll behave more like a traditional uh, internal combustion engine device. Uh, you can use these semiconductors in the charging station themselves and get a much more energy output from the battery charger to help have increasing speeds of battery charging uh, from a traditional station and reducing the overall weight of the car. Um, you save on the mechanicals that are needed to dissipate the power and the energy that the car is producing, uh, creating a lighter vehicle uh, and simplifying the materials that are needed to create an electric vehicle. And then on the industrial side, um, you get much lower loss and increased efficiency, which is critical to reducing the overall energy consumption of power supplies for servers, those servers that are powering the generative AI compute power, uh, and increasing the efficiency of renewables. So increasing the amount of power available off of the solar panel to be then stored within a battery system or go directly onto the grid. This reduces the total cost of ownership of these industrial systems by up to 20% is you reduce the, uh, again, the mechanical needs um, from a less efficient system, uh, as well as increasing the total overall output of the energy generation system. And then finally, none of this would be any good unless we were enabling our final end customer to be able to bring these things to market in an effective way. Things are changing so quickly that you can't just bring a valuable product to market without also having the expertise, without having the system knowledge without being able to go and actually teach the end users of these products the best way to implement uh, implement these solutions 
so that they can focus on innovating on the intelligence side, on the total system side, and bringing something to market, which is a really value-add proposition. So that's why our number one element in going to market is that we need to establish a value-add proposition with our customers. If you're looking for the next cheapest thing to come out of China that is all about low cost and you know who cares about the reliability, probably not where we're going to go for a play, right? We, we want to really have a strong impact with the innovators out there in the markets and industrial and automobile. Um, so we do this with consistent organization of our resources and our, our engineers in our lab and our technical marketing people, create intimate customer engagement with the customers, make sure that our limited resources are prioritized in the right way to make sure that the, you know we're always there and enabling them in the most efficient way. And of course, that customer collaboration is, is kept at an intimate uh, level all the way through to design production. So those of us in the semiconductor industry uh, are really enabling and are key partners of these end product uh, companies uh, in a way that you know, maybe you hadn't thought of before, particularly in power solutions. So with that, uh, I thank you for listening. Uh, at STU, we say our technology starts with you because it's really you and, and the, the, the collective you that uh, we want to impact the lives of with, in a positive way with our innovations. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you for making it easy to understand for someone who's not an engineer like myself. <laughs> um, I'm so for, for my first question um, to all, you know, we've touched on those end markets that are seeing rapid innovation in their products, generative AI being one of them. Um, and with these inv advances in, in innovation for these technologies, power consumption is increasing at, at a similar rate. Um, or similar pace. So what are the three most important factors when producing a, a power semiconductor um, uh, to make these technologies, the, the, the increasing power consumption more efficient? Um, Al, I'll, I'll begin with you to, to give your, your three most important factors. Sure, sure. So, you know, for, for high efficiency, you know, as engineers and business people, we always want to make things better and better and better. And I think the industry and our customers expect that, right? So I think, you know, Jeff mentioned on the semiconductor side, the kind of the basic physics of power devices is certainly important. Silicon carbide being well, one of them. Uh, GAN is another one. It's another wide uh, band gap material that is uh, gaining a lot of traction in the industry. And then even the, uh, you know, should I say, good old silicon technology, there still continues to be advancements even at the silicon level, right? Even though it's... Uh, several decades, you know, three, four or five decades in the making, there's still advancements there. So, and I would say on the second one, uh, power topologies are important. So we, we didn't get into detail, you know, I don't think this is the right form for such a thing, um, but one can imagine that there are lots of different types of power topologies that can be used uh, in to convert energy, right? Um, buck, boost, buck, boost, I can name, 25 of them, I, I won't do that, I'll spare, spare you guys the details. But, you know, there's even new ones being invented these days, right? There's a lot of research that's done in academia and at, um, at you know, companies like the ones represented here, where we do research kind of advanced topologies. Uh, sometimes these things can generate, you know, two, 3% additional efficiency, which doesn't sound like a lot, but again, a lot of our, these kind of advanced uses are thermally limited. So if you're at, say, 93% efficient in a solution today, and you say, wow, that's great, but you can get to 95 or 96, that is a lot of thermal energy or heat that then you don't have to deal with, which then implies you can run even more energy through that system, right? So it's actually quite important. Um, nowadays, a half a point improvement in efficiency, we, we, we love that. That's a great result, right? Um, and then I would say third, in terms of energy efficiency, has to do at the system level. So remember, like, you know, power management as a simplistic case is converting energy. Great. But if I'm able to measure and sense that energy, I know what my input power is, input current, output power, output current. I can, at a system level, be very selective in what I do with the system to save energy. Right? A classic example would be, you know, modern um, you know, kind of uh, digital chips, if you if you want to think about those, you can do what we call clock gating, right? So if I have this digital chip that can process many, many things and work very hard, 
Well, sometimes it doesn't have to work hard. So if that's happening and the system knows, it can scale the clock or it can gate areas of the chip off to save energy. So it becomes more of a system level optimization of energy usage to, well, to save energy, right? When you don't need to use all of it. So I would say those are kind of the three answers I have for that. Well, thanks. Thanks, Al. So uh, Atar, what are your three most important factors? Yeah, I will echo uh, what Al said. So system architecture is very, very important. Um, as I said, it's not a one-dimensional problem. You have to look it into a multi-dimensional site. Um, the, the whole power conversion on the AC to DC side is very archaic. It, it needs to evolve. Um, there is much more sophisticated DC DC conversion on the processor side, but upstream to the processor, it's the, the innovation has not happened at the at, at the pace where it needs to be. So re-architecting the system, one thing. The other thing is um, I focus a lot on robustness and, and reliability because anything that we can do to minimize the e-waste by increasing the life of their of these systems is important. In fact, Google has gone public and say they want to. Uh, focus more on reliability and robustness so that they can have the, the longer useful life of these systems. And the third thing is thermal management. Um, efficient packaging. Uh, the classic plastic QFN packages uh, are, are not suitable to solve these kind of problems. So the packages are designed with um, efficiency and cooling in mind so that when the cooling system is deployed on the system level, the power component takes the, you know, use the perfect benefit of how that power is extracted, right? Because any power which is used to heat the system makes the system uh, more less uh, uh, reliable, more un reliable going forward. So just to give you an idea, uh, vertical integration is super important because you cannot rely on foundries for innovation because foundry does everything for everybody. And that's why 70% of what we um, sell at Infineon, uh, we manufacture. Just to give you an idea, these power stages which are used in, uh, in, in powering these processor, they have silicon, which is one fifth the thickness of the human hair. Uh, because that is the only way to get the uh, RDS on, which is a technical term, and bring uh, the power losses. And that innovation has to be done when you control the destiny in your own hand, which is applicable for automotive, silicon carbide with gallium nitride, which is also applicable in, in vertical trench fed MOSFETs, which are used in power management for AI. Thanks, Althor. Um, Alaa, what are your three most important factors? Well, I, I think as, as uh, my colleagues mentioned here, understanding the system use case is very important because now where are the power dissipated? The power dissipated in the power delivery network and in the SOC. Power delivery, network, as, as Al and Atar mentioned, topologies need to be advanced topologies to manage those losses. And the 48 volt also migration is one, how to manage that, right? So you need to develop those the, uh, the topologies. But in the same time, the SOC is consuming power. And that's the reason I talk about the point of load innovation. You need faster architectures, you need to manage, as Al mentioned, you need to manage also the SOC, uh, how much leakage, how much dynamic power, how you monitor all of this cycle by cycle, those are very important topics. So if you manage the power and, and the dissipation inside the SOC and in the power, we call it energy network. Energy networks take you from the power supply, the original power supply, the AC supply down to the, the, the main uh, area. Atar mentioned something very important, interesting in his presentation, the modules. Modules actually are very important to manage also distribution losses on the board. And then finally, of course, the technology, as Jeff uh, mentioned, the uh, silicon carbide and again, why? Because the converter needs to be faster. So I need to switch a faster frequency. How I do this with silicon? GAN and silicon carbide will enable us to go to faster speed. So those are all important uh, cases. I think I talk about four points here, the system use case, the technology, the uh, topologies, and managing the distribution losses as well on the board. And rounding it off, Jeff, what are your three most important? Sure. Well, we just heard uh, we heard several really good ones. Uh, I'm, well, they may not be the most important. I'm going to try to bring some additional uh, thoughts here. But number one is is for sure innovation. Uh, you know, we talked about wide band gap, but even within wide band gap, continuing to evolve from 
uh, traditional structures like planar to trench to super junction. These are all very technical terms of how the power transistor is created. But there is just a bright future, even as mentioned, uh, I forget who mentioned it, but uh, standard silicon still has a long way to run. And we're going to continue to innovate, uh, you know, taking advantage of the latest equipment to, to produce the newest semiconductors. Um, the second one, I think, is really taking that what we have in our hand in having a clear value add proposition to bring to the customer so that they'll adopt it. Typically, these are not the cheapest products by themselves. Whatever is latest and most cutting edge by its nature uh, is going to be a bit more expensive because we don't have the yields that we have with traditional legacy products. We had to invest in new equipment. So if we want these to be impactful to the world, we have to make sure our customers see the value add and we can educate them and get them using them until it becomes a more sustaining, mature technology to adopt. So it's important for us to gain that knowledge and be able to sell it in the right way. And then lastly, uh, one of the major ones that we have to think about is our investment in the capacity. Uh, we've seen a lot of the CHIPS acts in, across the world, whether it be its variant in Europe or here in the United States, and they want to control their destiny in what they consider advanced technologies, which are often digital ones for you know, the actual training of the AI systems or the processing of communication. But power semiconductors, because they need to be able to conduct heat and because they are the source of moving the energy, need to take a lot of silicon, and they require a lot of wafers, and it's going to take a lot of fabs. And I'm worried that we're not investing as rapidly as we should in our ability to produce these, because if we're going to keep up with producing the energy from renewable sources, from non, uh, not, get away from non-renewable sources, we're going to need to have the acres of power semiconductor silicon in order to do that. So I think capacity is very critical. So, Robert, one more comment that I want to add, and I think is very important, is hyperscale customers, these are traditionally the software guys. Now, the software players are becoming the hardware players. Hardware is new to them. Power is very new to them. So it's an opportunity for all of us here to teach them how to think power before everything else. And that is the mindset that major players in, in the power here can influence the data center guys who are customizing their own chips for their own uses. And unfortunately, power is still after the fact. It is not um, designed at the same time when they think about what is the next generation SOC that they want to invest billions of dollars into. Uh, well, I'll tell you, that's a great point. So I, I, I guess a, a follow-up would be how do you how do you um, actually teach power first before everything else? Um, let's start, Jeff, why don't you start? It's a good question. Uh, and, and another point that I was thinking of making is, uh, you know, investments in our interactions with the universities. Um, you know, I, when I was becoming a power engineer uh, 20 years ago, even then, the class sizes were small for power electronics. It was, you know, maybe a dozen people out of, you know, the full electrical engineering and computer science field of several hundred. And I think it's dwindling uh, even more and more within American universities. So, uh, first of all, I think we need to to build up uh, the next generation of power electronics engineers with investment and, and engagement with semiconductor companies with our universities. But to, to answer your question more specifically on how do we, you know, take it to to less power experts, um, it's it's again, it's uh, I hate to keep saying this, but it's by going in with expertise as a semiconductor company with the mindset of knowing the end application as well or even better than our customers do, and conveying that in a positive value add way. Uh, and if you bring that message in the right way. Uh, they'll understand the importance of taking a look at, you know, for instance, total cost of ownership rather than the cost of a single device. I, I have a comment also. I, I think I think the some of my colleagues mentioned the uh, DC DC convert from China or um, basic ten cents converter or something like that. This doesn't work anymore. That doesn't work anymore. That I think the the market need to understand innovation and analog and power very important to enable the the GPUs and SOCs and the, and the, all those trends. It is not basic power management anymore. There's a lot of innovation in this area. Thank you. And and Al, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I definitely second that. There is a uh overall kind of less and less expertise at our customers, right? When it comes to power, I think that's very obvious. Um, 
you know, we definitely have a very well trained and uh, broadly based, uh, you know, field, you know, applications engineers, you know, technical people that go and try to help and do help many of our customers. That, that's one thing. Um, I, I would second that. I think in academia, you know, not sure that power management was ever that popular. But nowadays, uh, most people watch, you know, kind of the regular news. They hear about AI and, you know, EVs and all that and, and, and software, of course, right? And software is very popular uh, major these days. And somehow I think we need to be better at kind of advocating for, you know, these other things that are very fundamental, like power management is very fundamental to the world that we live in, right? And it's actually very exciting. Yeah. But a lot of people don't know about it, right? So th therefore, they don't know to even think about perhaps uh, starting a career, you know, in this area. Um, I think when I went through, you know, school and graduate school back in the day, it also wasn't popular, right? It was barely talked about. But I, I think it's such a fascinating field that mixes, you know, physics and control theory and mixed signal. You know, it's it kind of, it, it's really a whole system, right? It, it's not an op amp. It is much more complicated than that. And so it's actually very exciting. And I think we have to do better advocating for kind of visibility so that people, you know, younger people know about it, right? So that they can hopefully choose a, a career in that area. But uh, yeah, we're, it is an issue. Yep. So Atar, to, to round it off, what, what, is, what is your suggestion? So the days of incremental innovation is are over. Everything is disruptive. Everything is multiple X in terms. It's not about 0.1%, 0.2% anymore. Two things that comes to my mind is joint labs with the customer, so we go deeper. And the second thing is enabling the ecosystem topologies where we partner among each other. It's not, it's not about my topology, my licensing, this and that, because the, the money is not in the topology. The money is how do you come up with a system given certain topology to make that topology the best performing topology? So the close collaboration with the stalwarts of power year management and 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 Google has done that. Huh? Allah had mentioned about the switch cap converters. Uh, Google a few years ago started with what they call the zero uh, switching converter ZSC systems, uh, and and they said, okay, this is a topology anybody can use it. Um, now. It depends on how, what your offering is going to be to make your topology shine compared to the com com competition. So it's may it's so the name of the game going forward is not competition, is cooperation, where you cooperate and you compete. I think that's a great way to end the webinar. Um, I want to thank my excellent panelists, um, Jeff from ST Micro, Al from ADI, Allah from um, NXP, and and Atar from Infineon. Um, just for the audience awareness, a recording of this webinar will be on the website as well as um, a copy of the presentations from my from my excellent panelists. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you to my panelists and we'll see you in the next webinar.